Oh, 
A uh, couple of different ways to get involved when we think about our ways to connect people to outreach. Uh, first off, last week we actually opened up our Calvary Kids. So give it up for them because we had a great time last week. We can see some of the photos of the fun that they had. I was joking with some of the parents earlier that they may want to hang out there because they had a lot more fun there than you may have in here. But uh, it was a great time to just fellowship. The kids were learning at their level. Uh, we do have opportunities for need, a need for more volunteers, so if you feel the call, and I know someone who uh, just loves being around kids, uh, we'd love to have you uh, be a part of that, and we're thankful to have our kids and our youth uh, back in full effect. Uh, we also have some opportunities, uh, I know we mentioned it last week, but in the coming weeks, uh, this will be the last weekend for collection for food share, and on the 21st, we're actually going to get together and uh, go out and serve from our Fort Lauderdale campus the actual food that was collected. So whether you go online and donate some uh, food items or whether you financially gave, it's an opportunity to come together and you actually go and drop off the food to people's houses. It's actually possible to stay safe uh, with masks, etc. But if you've never done that before, uh, it's a really fun thing to do. We could do it as a family and you go. And there's always an opportunity to pray with somebody, especially in this season, who's maybe having a hard time. And now you're dropping off a bag of food, maybe a Bible, and just encouraging them. So it's so needed. It's such a great thing to do this time of year. Also, Operation Christmas Child, we got the shoeboxes out there. Uh, pray over a shoebox, collect some items. Uh, you can drop it off here. You can drop it off at any of our campuses, most of our campuses. And that is a great opportunity to be able to have, share the love of Jesus with a child, probably in another place in the world. Um, but it's a really cool thing. We usually do one for each one of our children, which is now four, so it's a lot over the years. But uh, it's one thing to do to get kids involved. We can do it by the same age and what they are. Uh, pray about how God will lead you. Uh, with that, and then uh, finally, as far as uh, opportunities to get involved, we talked last week about the celebration of peace that we're going to be having to drive through experience on a Fort Lauderdale campus. Uh, I would uh, highly encourage you to at least attend, but if you have an opportunity to volunteer and be a part of some of the teams, and so we still need help with construction, uh, we still need some help with some of our teams, whether you're a part of the group that's actually you know, singing and dancing and having fun, or just reading and serving or building stuff, uh, celebration of peace is a drive through to Christmas, lights, and just a, I think it's like a 15 minute experience uh, of fun and winter wonderland experience, but ending with a gospel message and ending with an opportunity for prayer. So I'd uh, love to have you there. Uh, that will be starting, I think it's the 10th or something like that in December. So that weekend, the first couple of weekends in December, we'll be running it for most of uh, the last two weekends of December up until Christmas weekend. So looking forward to all that God will do. Uh, obviously, being in this place, uh, this is our, our, our place in America. We're going to be here at least to the end of the year and hopefully beyond until God provides us with our own building. Uh, so we're thankful for this place. But before we get into our message, I did want to just take a moment to pray. Because when Paul opens up this letter, he's going to be talking about prayer. And we'll get into it in just a moment. But when you look at what's going on in our world and in our country, and whether you agree with whatever decisions were made, uh, whatever side that you're on, uh, I pray that everybody in this place and everybody online is on the side of Jesus. And so that's the most important place that we can be because we trust and know that if he is truly sovereign, which we know that he is, then he's in control of all things. He's in control of what happened with these decisions that happened. He's in control of the leaders uh, of our country, the leaders locally. And so I am sure as these uh, men and women that are in these new positions, whether it's in our, our mayors, whether it's our commissioners, whether it's our school board officials, they probably feel some hesitation and, hey, what's this next step I'm jumping into as well? And whether they're believers or not. Uh, these are the people that God chose, whether we like it or not. They're there because God chose them. And we want to just pray for our, our local and our national leadership uh, of our country. So if you join me in a, in a word of prayer for our country, for our leaders, and of course, for our time today. Father, we come to you today, Lord, and it's just a day where there are decisions that have been happening all over this country. And for some, it's caused a lot of division. And we want to just pray for your continued love and unity across all of our world and all of our country, even down here in South Florida. Lord, we want to we pray for our leaders that you have put in control, that you have put in charge. We want to pray for our, 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 our new president-elect Joe Biden. We want to pray for our vice president-elect Kamala Harris. We want to pray for our, our current president, Donald Trump, and our current vice president, Mike Pence. We want to pray for uh, those of us who live in the city of Parkland, for our new mayor-elect, Rich Walker. We want to pray for all of our, our commissioners, for Bob Mayerson, for Ken Cutler, for Jordan Israel, for Simeon Breyer, for all those who are, are coming into these new school board positions, for all those around our country, Lord. We want to just lift them up to you. 
that whatever decisions that need to be made, whatever leadership uh, that needs to happen, Lord, that you can just guide them and direct them. And if they don't know you, that this will just be a humble opportunity for them to be on their knees before decisions are made. Whatever side of the fence they were on uh, prior to this, Lord, we pray that this will be a time of unity and a time where we can all walk closely with you, knowing that you're in control of all things. And so we pray you can bless our time today. Uh, speak to us from your words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's go for a walk today. When you hear somebody invite you for a walk, you probably think of many things. Perhaps it's this long walk on the beach with your spouse, and it's a nice, relaxing time. Perhaps it's a time when your boss says, hey, let's go for a walk, and, well, maybe it's a raise or a promotion that's coming, or the other side of things. Typically, if someone has something important to say, perhaps they start this start on the walk. Uh, but I know someone that gets more excited about walks than I've ever seen before in my life, especially going on a walk with me. And no, it's not my wife, unfortunately, although she loves it. But it's my dog, Cooper. I want to introduce you to him. This was a picture a few years ago. Yeah, he's like a 70 pound golden rule that we have from time to time carried in the past. I don't know if I can do it now. But he loves going on walks. It's one of his favorite things. It's an opportunity that we do every night. Uh, yes, for the real reason, it's important that we get dogs outside. But it's also an opportunity to draw clothes and kind of build our relationship and take a peaceful stroll down the road and, uh, you know, for him to kind of smell and uh, just kind of be in fellowship with his master or his owner or his father, if you would. And, you know, there are actually some benefits for dog uh, owners walking their dogs, for the dog himself, obviously, but it's also for the owner. I was reading this interesting article about walking dogs, which, why are we reading this? I don't know, but... It was on the conversation.com. It said, in many ways, uh, the walk reflects this uh, historical social order of like the dog, human domination over this animal submission, if you would. But then for the owner, it's actually a kind of cool thing because if you love your dog like I do, uh, you actually like seeing your dog have fun and be out and doing these kind of things. And when we go on this walk together, you know, we, we feel close as I'm walking with my dog. And maybe for you, you've taken a lot of walks during this pandemic season because it's Maybe it wasn't a whole lot else to do. So if you're like us, we found ourselves walking with the kids a lot, with their dog a lot, taking bikes out, and just being out in nature and enjoying this experience of the walk. But when you think about dogs, when you think about this submission, well, when he obviously is on a leash, but he has no choice but to submit to me wherever I decide to walk him. And I think about it this way. You know, if I told you the God of the universe wants to take a walk with you, what would you think? And I know we're not putting ourselves in the dog position, but yes, it's true. Yes, our God wants us to walk with him. When we use this term, walking with God, and we say, hey, I want to walk with you all the days of my life, well, what does that really mean? And for me, it was a picture of this dog walk experience, or this walking with the family experience. But typically in a walk, there's conversation happening. Typically in a walk, there's, you know, fellowship of some kind, there's laughing, there's a, a joy that comes out of it, and we have this opportunity to walk with God. And it's actually, Scripture speaks of it in Micah, uh, chapter 6, verse 8, verse 8 says, He has shown to you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Walk humbly with your God. Maybe if you're a dog owner and you first got your dog, it wasn't as humble an experience because your dog was trying to kind of go all over the place. But eventually they learn this submission to go where their master is kind of leading them. And from time to time, they may chase a squirrel here and there. But ultimately, they're going to follow where the master is telling them to go. And I think about it in our life. Well, if we're truly called to walk with our Father, we're truly called to walk with God all the days of our life, well, how often are we trying to kind of go our own direction? and not submit to our Father. We've been going through this book, Colossians. It's this letter that was written by Paul. He wrote it to this church in Colossae, and it was this church that he actually never been to. And if you've been with us over the last uh, five weeks or so, you've seen that he's writing this letter, he's speaking this encouragement, and he's talking to his people. And most of his mission is really through prayer, but it's Paul that's speaking encouragement. Throughout, hey, it's really important that you know who Jesus is, first off. It's kind of where he opens the letter. Like, he is the image of the invisible God. And then he kind of moves on to saying, hey, it's not about religion, per se. It's really about the relationship that you have 
with him. It's not because we're tied to a leash like our dogs are. It's because we want to walk with God, and he wants to walk with us. Well, if you were this last week, he actually talks about our family life. What does it look like in and out of the home? The home is where our first ministry takes place. It's how are we as husbands? How are we as wives? How are we as fathers and mothers and sons and daughters? How are we in the workplace? How are we as employees and employers? What does that relationship look like? And now, as he comes to his closing chapter for you, it was a letter, so it may not be originally written in chapter format, but in his closing, he's going to speak to us about what our life looks like as we continue to be equipped, looking for open doors, and walking with God throughout our days. And the Bible spoke about many men who walk with God. In fact, it was really three of them. Two in particular. One of them was Enoch, the book of Genesis. And the other was Noah, that they were described as those who walk with God. And my prayer after this weekend is really thinking through, well, how can I maybe just take a little bit step closer to ensuring that my walk is strong with the Lord? And so he's going to give us some instructions in how we are to walk with God in this world. And so if you're in Colossians chapter 4, we're going to start in verse 2. It says, Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. And so the first point we talk about, if we're going to be walking with God, well, the first thing he calls us to do is walk in prayer. Walk in prayer. Well, typically, are you supposed to be like on your knees, or are you supposed to be somewhere in a seated position, or uh, maybe down face the ground, down to the floor? But this walk that we have constantly, prayer should not just be a, a once a time uh, thing, maybe once a day, once in the morning, at night, uh, before we go to bed, maybe it's before we eat. Prayer is never meant to be that. You see, prayer is this constant communication, this constant conversation with God. And Paul's telling us that, hey, I want you to have this relationship and be uh, continued earnestly in prayer. He's saying be vigilant with thanksgiving. And sometimes when you think about prayer, you think about this passive, okay, I'm going to say these things, and then you know, be on my knees, and that's it. That's kind of the end of it. But he's saying it is a very vigilant thing that we want to do in thanksgiving. And, and he gives some specific instructions on what we should be praying for. And I'll tell you, he's going to talk a little about these doors that have been opened for us, but there has never been more of an open door than 2020. <laughs> an open door for prayer, an open door to share the gospel, because there are so many people that are looking for hope. And although they may not see it, and although they may not act that way, we all need some form of hope in our lives. And we know that hope for all can only come from the Word of God. And He wants to give us that peace and that comfort, but we need to be walking with Him. We need to be in constant communication with Him because prayer is, is simply talking to God. We try to overcomplicate it. Many religions try to put in what words to say and how many times to say it and say it 800 times and that kind of thing, but it was never meant to be that way. And Jesus actually gave us the model and how we should be praying. But can you imagine if you're going on a walk with someone and just by totally silent, not saying a word? Like, I don't know, I even talk to my dog Cooper when I walk with you because it's just one of those things where you, you talk and say things and conversations come up and do important things and you're dreaming about the future. And, if you think about a walk with God, it should be some way simple. There should be communication happening. You know, God, let me tell you, this is what I'm feeling about. I know you know my needs, but these are some things that I think, uh, these are my desires that I have. Like, I want to have this job, or I want my relationship to be uh, restored, or I want to uh, make X amount of money, or I want to win the lottery. Maybe that's not a great prayer, but <laughs> there's some requests that we want to throw out there that it's just communication that we want to constantly be having with God. There's something about taking this walk and being continuing in prayer. So even when we don't feel like he hears us, the truth is he hears us. And we need to speak to him as if he does. We need to bring all of our requests to God. And even though it may not seem like it's on time with our expectations and our time, maybe we're not happy with decisions that were made. And not just talking about yesterday's decision with the election, but there are a lot of things that happened in our world where we may not be thrilled with the outcome. Maybe we are thrilled with the outcome, but it wasn't the right timing of the outcome. It was interesting in the Gospel of Luke, there was a time where two faithful friends of Jesus himself, as he walked this earth, 
So it's God walking the earth as a man, Jesus. He has this relationship with these uh, sisters, Mary and Martha. Perhaps you're familiar with their story. And he had a brother named Lazarus. And Mary and Martha had this faith that when something were to go wrong, they had this relationship with Jesus that they would go to him. Which is a great advice for all of us. But in Luke chapter 11, we see a, a situation that occurred that they thought Jesus was not time for. And it was with their brother Lazarus. See, the brother Lazarus became very sick. And they called upon Jesus to come and heal our brother. We know you have the power to do it, so there's a faith element to this prayer. And we're asking you now, if you can, just bring this miracle, miraculously heal our brother Lazarus. And in Luke chapter 11, starting verse 1, it says, Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, The sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And what does that mean? Well, if you're familiar with the story, Jesus did not respond in the time that his sisters wanted to. You see, there's a request in something that we want, or we desire right now, much like Lazarus being sick. And we want, just like Mary and Martha, to bring that request to Jesus. But what Jesus is saying here is, hey, I think your desire is that I would come right away, that I would heal your brother Lazarus, and all of a sudden this miracle will be across town, and everything will be back to normal. But Jesus has a different plan. He says specifically in his response that the sickness is not unto death, Although, if you know the story, Lazarus does in fact die. But he says, for the glory of God, the Son of God may be glorified through it. See, God had a better plan. He wasn't just going to go and heal Lazarus because he allowed him to die. But if you can tell the story, when Jesus came, he actually had an opportunity to call Lazarus from the tomb and raise him from the dead. Yes, Jesus was not the first. There were others that he raised from the dead as he walked this earth. And he was something... He was doing something way greater than a miracle of healing. He was raising someone from the dead back to life. And to the sisters, when he said, hey, I'm not going to be here quite yet, and they see that his brother actually dies, I would imagine there's some shaking faith that are happening in that time. But when they see their brother coming out from the tomb, removing these you know, great cross and now being alive again, what an amazing miracle that God is going to be glorified through. He said, for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through this miracle. And so I asked him, talking about praying, Paul, Paul reminds us to pray, he says how important it is, you know, what is that you've been asking Jesus for that maybe just didn't happen yet? Maybe it just didn't happen the way you thought. You see, if everything went according to our plan, the world would probably look a lot different. I know it would if it were up to me. And I'm thankful that it's not. But he tells us, hey, have this relationship, be earnest, continuing in prayer, regardless of the outcome or whatever happens. We need to trust that God is in control. And just like when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, even though he didn't heal a lot of time, according to Mary and Martha, there was a miracle that occurred, God was glorified through it, and the outcome was way better than they could have expected. God has a better plan for Lazarus, he has a better plan for our country. They have a better plan for you. And so we need to continue in prayer. And, and, he, and he says, not just prayer in general, he says, be earnest in your prayer. Like, have great effort in prayer. And in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus actually tells us, in a sense, how to pray. He doesn't say do this word for word, but he tells us how to pray because the disciples at that time, they're seeing these miracles occur. But what they're also seeing in the life of Jesus is they're seeing that he actually demonstrates and lives by prayer. Because if we know that Jesus is God, which you know, we've been studying through this these last two chapters, we know that that's true. Why would he have need to pray to himself? But he's modeling this behavior, this relationship of the Father and the Son. Yes, they are one. But he actually prays. And, and when the disciples came and asked him in Matthew chapter 6, in verse 8, he says, Therefore do not be like them. He says, For your Father knows the things you have in need of before you ask him. And, of course, he gives him the instructions. He says, in this manner, therefore pray. And this will probably be familiar to most of you. He says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And do 
not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is that prayer that many of you are probably familiar with, you grew up with, you memorized. But yes, it's scripture that Jesus speaks, hey, pray this way. He doesn't say you have to use these exact words. But you pray in a manner of, well, you're thanking God first for all that he has done. You're giving him your requests, yes, for your daily prayer, your daily provision. But you're also asking, hey, your will, not my will. And Jesus prayed that in the garden before he was crucified, too. Our prayer should always be whatever it is that we're asking. It shouldn't be just, hey, whatever it is that I desire. Yes, we're going to put a request before him, but ultimately we want his will. We don't want ours. He knows way better than we could ever imagine. So we want to trust him in it. But we also want to thank him for all the things that he's done. So when Paul says, hey, pray with thanksgiving, he's not just talking about this holiday that's coming in a few weeks. Although we'll have a great opportunity to, uh, to, to practice this. And as we're over our turkey and our stuffing and our pies and all that, it's remembering that every time that we pray, we should pray with thanksgiving. He says this is an intentional opportunity to thank God for what he's done. To thank him for what he hasn't done yet, and even thank him for the things like with Lazarus that maybe didn't go exactly the way we planned. We want to be thankful for the fact that God is on the move. Philippians 4, Paul reminds the church of Philippi, he says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. It's so important that whatever it is that we desire, whatever it is that we're asking, yes, we're giving to God, but we're asking for His will, and we're thanking Him for all the things that He's done. And in this church, He's also saying, hey, you know, you want to be grateful for the things that He's done as well, because it's very often that God will move, and He will give us what we desire. He will heal us from something. That was a horrible experience that while we're in it, we could have never imagined coming out of it. But now all of a sudden we're looking back and saying, hey, I can't believe I got through that experience. Hey, I can't believe uh, we had those children that I never thought we would have. Hey, I can't believe I got that job that I now have. And it was actually this week that I was reminded. I had an opportunity uh, over the last few months, maybe a little longer, uh, I've been studying for this exam. And this exam is uh, in, in securities licensing. It's kind of, for me, it was one of the hardest things I've ever done. For some of you guys, you probably do it without studying. But if any of you guys have ever been through, like, I don't know, real estate licensing or any type of exam, maybe you have your law degree or any type of test you remember from school, it's a stressful period because there's a lot on the line. And you can't put in, investing all this time in studying and getting ready. And sometimes, if you're like me, you're like, just like seems to leak out of you. And you're like, how is this material just literally leaking out from like one day to the next? Like it's just not staying in my head for some reason. But you know, then you have that opportunity. The test day is up. And for, for many of you, for those who are believers, sometimes on the test day, those who are not believers become believers because that's the day where you're in so much pressure <laughs> and stress. And you're praying like you've never prayed before. And I'll tell you this week, there was a morning where I was praying like I was never praying before about this exam that I had to take. And I got to the site and I uh, had the opportunity to take it, and I don't know, sometimes with some of these tests, when you're actually taking them, the whole time, I'm like, I want to say I was completely faithful and knew that God was in control of all things, but I was like, this is going really bad. I was like, man, I'm going to fail this thing, this is so terrible, i got to go back and tell everybody I had this chance to take this thing, and I failed miserably. And, well, I tell you the story now, because I thankfully did pass it. I'm not going to run the call necessarily. But what I did is, well, first off, in your test site, you're supposed to be it's a really quiet place. I did say thank you, Jesus, when I saw the score. Um, <laughs> so there's my witness. And then uh, I, I immediately went to the restroom for one other reason. But also, uh, I, I just had to get on my knees. And some of you guys have told before, like, I remember other times where, like, sometimes you're in a place and it's awkward to do it in front of people. So, like, the restroom is the first place you go, and hopefully the floors are clean. But I didn't care at that point. I was so thankful that God came through for me. I was on my knees just thanking him. For what he's done, because I was like, man, there is no way I could have done that in my own strength. There's just no way. And perhaps you're thinking about experience in your head that you're like, there's no way I could have done that without him. Or there's something that's coming up that you're like, there's no way that I can do this without him. And I'll tell you, it's not the worst place in the world to be because you're reliant, you're dependent on something greater than yourself and your ability. And Paul's saying, hey, when you pray, do it with thanksgiving. Be thankful. Don't just say, all right, great, you got me what I want, and on to the next thing. Because some of us, it's a very easy thing to do. When we get what we wanted, we're moving on, and now what's the next desire? But take time. Be like uh, the, the leper in Luke 17. You can read that one from homework. It's one of my favorite Thanksgiving scriptures in Luke 17. 
uh, in verse 11, uh, the story of the ten lepers. Jesus heals them all, but only one comes back to actually thank him. And we want to be like that one as we get closer to Thanksgiving. Uh, the things that we pray for, whether he gives it to us or not, we're going to thank him for it. Whether it goes our way or not, we want to be thankful for uh, the needs of others. And when we pray for we want to be praying for those needs of ourselves. It's okay to bring those desires to him. But when we're praying, we also want to make sure when we're saying, hey, pray earnestly, you know, make it an active thing, uh, we got to be careful our posture when we're praying. Because some of us are familiar with, like, the, the pillow prayers where we kind of start praying and then we're falling asleep. And I'll say, you know, there's, there's no sin that says, hey, you're going to automatically lose your salvation if you fall asleep while you're praying. Uh, I think, because there's so many other references where this happened, in fact, Matthew 26 spoke about some of the disciples in the garden that were with Jesus, that he told to stay awake, and they actually fell asleep while they were supposed to be praying. So I think it's an okay thing if you do fall asleep. It's not the worst place to be. Those of us who have kids, it was even last night, one of my sons was uh, laying on me as we were watching all the fun stuff on TV, and uh, he actually fell asleep on me. And then my daughter came up and sat on the couch, and we both like literally fell asleep on the couch right next to me. And I'm like, if I was God, sometimes I think about like, what I'd be like, hey, stay awake, come on, you're supposed to be watching this work. If I'm reading you something, don't fall asleep while I'm reading you, but I just love the fact that they're there with me and they fall asleep and they're right there with me. So I think if you fall asleep and we pray, it's not the worst thing in the world. But the important thing is that we're praying, that we have this relationship with Jesus, so much so that we're in this constant walk of prayer and communication with him. But then he speaks about this door. He said, pray for this door to be open. Pray for an open door. And an open door is a very inviting experience. If you work in the workplace, sometimes you have this open door policy, and it's an where you have the ability to come to me at any time. And so what's this open door that Paul is praying for? Well, we're going to read a little further in Colossians 4, going into verse 5. He's telling us to walk in wisdom for those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. And so we're gonna if we're gonna be walking with God, yes, we're gonna walk in prayer, but then we're also gonna walk as a witness. Walk as a witness. Well, this open door that he's praying for is a door for the gospel to be spoken. And if we're gonna be a witness in our world, we want to be praying for opportunities. Opportunities not just here in the church, but opportunities in your workplace, opportunities with your family. Maybe opportunities at the Thanksgiving dinner table in just a few weeks where someone you know that has their own views and has their own beliefs and always has this closed door of what their mindset really is. Paul is saying, hey, pray for these doors to be open. Because if you know, his mission was to reach the Gentiles. You know, Peter and the apostles were chosen, primarily the Jews. The Jews were the ones that were first being reached. And the fact that, you know, Jesus called Paul to go and reach the Gentiles it, it's a crazy thing. It's almost like when you come to somebody here to say, hey, I'm going to send you off to like another country, maybe a, a Muslim country or a country that does not believe, and you're going to be right in the midst of this mission field, and we want to look for open doors to, to, to get the gospel out. And you're like, well, I know these people, wherever it is that you're being called to. They don't believe, and they're, they're, their minds are closed to this whole uh, position of Jesus being God and all that. But Paul's saying, hey, pray for this door to be open. Pray for minds to be open. Pray for opportunities for us to have conversations with people that your word can be revealed through the way that we love people, through the way that we respond to things. The, the response over this election can go many ways. And, and when Paul's speaking about, hey, you know, you speak, uh, have your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt. What is he saying? Well, when you're seasoned with grace or seasoned with salt, salt typically will make you know, food tastes better, it preserves things, salt has uh, a lot of great purposes, but some of us are overdoing it a little bit with salt. <laughs> and then some are just not putting enough salt. And for those with not enough salt, well, what have your conversations been sounding like lately? Have your conversations been seasoned with grace or seasoned with salt? Better yet, pandemic, maybe even home, what do your Facebook posts look like? Have your Facebook posts been seasoned with salt or seasoned with grace or are these harsh attacks against the other side or whatever these opinions may be? Could somebody look at your Facebook history and say, hey, this person's a believer? <laughs> Forget about the conversation. Just look at the posts, and that can say a lot about the grace and the salt that he tells us to be. And so with this open door that he speaks of, 
how, when we have the opportunity to speak with those who perhaps are not believers, how are we being salt and light to the world that is very dark and very distasteful, if you would? Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 5 that we're to be salt and we're to be light to the world. Some of us, we do a great job of being that guy in light. Any opportunity we have, we kind of this flashlight and hey, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be too bright, I'm going to guide you to the right direction. But then there's some of us that have like the, the high beam headlight in front of people's faces. And if you've ever known these people, uh, I've known a few in my days. And as an early believer, there was someone very close to me that was this way. And, and I remember I'd bring friends around them, and all they would do is talk about Jesus. And I'm still very early and still on the side in, in, in my faith. And it was kind of a turn off. It was almost like if it's totally dark and someone just turns on the eye in your face, uh, that's a little too bright for me. You know, but then there's some that have their light is so dim that, you know, when you think about a flashlight and batteries are dying, and it's such a dim light that it can't, you can't even really see in front of you. And there's some Christians out there that are this dim light. Now, like some people will look and say, I don't even know that person's really believe. And, 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 and it kind of could be a bad reputation or a bad name for those of us who are believers. And so we have to be careful with our salt and our light. That as with recipes at time, I'm not much of a chef. But no, if you put too much salt in something, it's probably not going to be good. And if you don't put enough, well, it's probably not going to be good either. And so you have to have just the right amount of salt. And it just uh, not the right amount of light. So that when these doors are open, when we're sitting in a place with people who are not believers, when we're walking in our neighborhood, and neighbors are walking by, the way that we treat each other, the way that we treat other people, the way that we're loving our people, this is that open door that God has given us to be a witness. If it's just going out and, you know, preaching the gospel in a, in, a, in a park somewhere is a great thing, but none of us are called to do that. But the most powerful experience that we can have is the way that we speak with people. And this is what Paul is reminding the people <coughs> in Colossae is, hey, let your conversation be seasoned with salt. Let them be seasoned with grace so that people will know that you are a believer. And that people will see my love, Jesus, love, through the way that we speak with one another. Because we know that words matter. And you've probably heard the quote that, for some, we may be the only Bible that they'll ever read. And so before they think of this, think about how we're living our lives. What do they read? What do they see? What do they hear in our lives? And how is God using us as a witness? God's concerned about our personal prayer life, but he's also concerned with our interaction with the world. He could easily have just say, okay, you're saved, here you go, let's go in heaven, you're with me forever. But when we're saved, for most of us, we're not put out in our mission field. And so as we walk as a witness in the world, as we follow Paul's reminder and Jesus' reminder, we want to be salt and light for all of those who are walking with All those that he puts around us. That is our mission field. And so then Paul says, okay, if you're going to walk as a witness, well, some of us know that the life of the Christian walk is not meant to be walking alone. We're not meant to be alone in this walk. And so in the next few verses, starting verse 7, Paul is going to introduce us to some of his friends. He's going to introduce us to the men that God has put around him on this mission. And so let's, let's look into them, and I'll go through a little description of who these men are. And I'll try not to butcher their names too much, but here we go. Tychicus, a beloved brother faithful minister and fellow servant of the Lord will tell you all the news about me. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you, they will make known to you all things which are happening here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you receive instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, these are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God, who are of the circumcision. They have proved to be a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a bondservant of Christ, greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has a great zeal for you. And those who are in Laodicea and those in Hierapolis, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and Nymphus in the church that is in his house. Now, if we're going to walk in prayer, if we're going to walk as a witness, well, point number three, we don't want to walk alone. We can't walk alone. God doesn't put us out there on our own. 
Even though we may feel that way at times, and sometimes depending on where you are, maybe your workplace or your ministry or your church, you may feel like you're on your own. You know, God kind of put you in this position and everyone's kind of betrayed you and now you're just, okay, it's just me against everything else here. But the reality is, we obviously should know that if we're walking with God, we know that He is with us always. But He also provides people to encourage us. And the people that Paul spoke through, or spoke of here, these are his fellow workers, he describes them as. And we see that in Christianity, it's a team sport. And, and any great teams in sports or like, it's never just about one person. Some may see it that way, but for the most part, it's the way the team works together. They may have, your, your people have different giftings. Some person may be really good at, you know, one type of shot, and one person may be really good at uh, a different type of rock. Now, in ministry, there are some that are called to, to greet, some that are called to teach, some that are called to, you know, lead worship up here. That is not my call. <laughs> Thankful for you. Uh, but, you know, the reality is God calls us to be in all these different positions. And what really matters most in this team is it's not about, when you think about the jersey, it's not about the name on the back so much. It's the name that's in front. That team Jesus, that Christian, being a Christian. That's the team that we're all a part of. Whatever our name is, yeah, we're called for a specific purpose, but we want to all play on the same team. And so the names that are named here, and if you read through most of Paul's letter, he speaks of men that have joined, typically his enemies from time to time. He, he throws out these different names, and for some of you who, you know, fall asleep and get a little bored when his list of names start, hopefully, you know, if you go through what some of these names and who these men were, um, you'll have a greater understanding of who God is calling perhaps in your life. Because the question I have for you is, who's in your circle? Yeah, who are the circle of friends? Who are the people that he's put around you? Because some of you guys know the quote of, like, tell me who your friends are, or tell you who you are. And, and you can tell a lot about what your friends and the people that you're around. In fact, in Proverbs 13, it says, he who walks with wise men will be wise. But the companion of fools will be destroyed. And so who you surround yourself with, yourself with matters. The words you use matters, who you surround yourself with matters. And I think about even with our campus, like, there's no church that's ever about just one person. There's no business, typically, that's about one person. There's always a team behind the scenes. And I wanted just to show you a, a photo of, uh, of some of our team as we put this campus, you know, God put this campus together just a, a year and a half or so ago. He put together, that's just some of our volunteers and some of been in and out, but I think about this team as he goes through this list of names, and I could spend some time going through all the names in this group or uh, serving with us today, but we'd be here all day almost. But I think about this encouragement that he says, hey, these people, I'm going to bring to you. Because yes, I remember when God's placed the vision in my heart to say, hey, yes, you live in the city of Parkland, and I want to do a work in Parkland, and I was humbled the fact that God's going to use me, but I'm not just going to use you. And so he brought people, I remember in a coffee shop in Carmel, out of the woodwork. People that I've never even met before. Uh, and he just started coming out and saying, hey, you know, I, 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 I want to get behind what God's doing here. Hey, I have this gift of working with AV, or I have this gift of you know, worship, or I have this gift of hospitality, and I want to use it. And, and there's just so many people that I could go through the list, much like Paul does, this, this endearment, these terms of these people that God has brought into my life for this very purpose. And how he continues to use uh, all of you, many of you in some way. Maybe now, maybe in the future. However, he's putting together this team, this family. that God's using for his purpose. And so when you think about the kind of people that Paul needed around him, we look at people like Hippolytus. We see that he's a person who was not afraid to speak up. He describes them uh, in a few different places. In fact, in Ephesians uh, chapter 6, he describes them as a beloved brother and a faithful minister in the Lord. You see, we all need people who are not afraid to speak up, who are not afraid to share the gospel, yes, but then we need those people with that gift of prophecy, and, and you know who they are, maybe you're one of them, that's not afraid to kind of tell somebody like, uh, hey, what you just did, yeah, that, that wasn't good. Or to say, hey, uh, you know, maybe if you did something this way, or the person who's not afraid to tell you how that piece of broccoli you keep, or spinach, you know, we, we all need that in our life, someone who's not afraid to speak up and speak something into your life. And hopefully it's encouraging, but when we need to hear something that's truth in our life, we need those people as well. And Titicus, he's this faithful minister, he was a helper, he's somebody that was out there that was uh, not afraid to say what needed to be said. But then this uh, Anisimus, who we'll actually hear about in the next couple of weeks as we go through the letter of uh, Philemon. But he is, uh, he's called to be this, uh, this helper. 
He was actually a slave that was owned by a believer in, in Colossae. And we'll, we'll hear more about his life in the coming weeks. But he was a man that was a helper. And for all of us, yes, we need people to encourage and be faithful and minister and speak into our lives, but we also need someone who's going to help us in whatever it is that needs to be done. Maybe it's that person who's really good at getting stuff done around the house and we're just not. Maybe it's somebody who, hey, I have the ability to, much like with Moses, who's provided with Aaron that can go and speak for you, you know, use these gifts and put it all together. He was this helper that was provided to Paul. Then there were some of the Jewish friends. He said there was only three of the Jewish heritage uh, that walked with him. Aristarchus, he was this Macedonian from Thessalonica. And he was somebody that, out of all this group, was kind of labeled as someone who was very loyal. And if you read through many of these men, the book of Acts, to speak of many of them, Acts chapter 20, talk a lot about uh, Aristarchus here. But he was somebody that was loyal. He was somebody who was with Paul through thick and through thin, as they say. And we all need somebody who's going to be with us when times are tough and when times are good. There were times when Paul was in prison. He spoke about being in chains. This man, Aristarchus, being with him. He was uh, in this mob, this Ephesian mob that came up with him in Acts chapter 19. And Aristarchus was there with him. When they set sail for Rome on this journey, Aristarchus had the world. He's one of those guys that somebody says he was called to just be a slave, if you would, to Paul and say, hey, I am with you no matter what. Uh, we all need people with that type of loyalty in our lives. And there's men like Mark. Mark, who, yes, there was a falling out if you read through his history. Uh, but this man, who's actually a nephew of uh, Barnabas, he actually wrote the Gospel of Mark. He was a man that, even though there was division, there was uh, an opportunity to repent and forgive. And don't we all need people who are uh, forgiving in our lives, for our sake? And honestly, for the relationship to continue, we have to be forgiving of others, but also have people who can forgive when we make those wrong decisions. And this was this man, Mark. We see people like uh, Jesus or Justice, who we don't know a whole lot about, uh, but he was there. We see uh, this man, a uh, 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 pastor. Uh, this man probably called to be this prayer warrior in our life. And I'd say for most of us, the most important thing a friend can be is a prayer warrior. Someone who's always like, hey, I'm going to pray for you, or I'm praying for you, for whatever that need may be. And so he ends up this list saying, these are people who brought me comfort. And so for you, when you look at your circle of friends, and family you can't always choose, but when you look at the friends and people we hang out with, are they people that we would say they're comforting, they're loyal. They're praying for me. They're not afraid to speak into my life. They're encouragers in my life. And you see how Jesus brought these people into the life of Paul. He spoke of Luke, who was this physician that was around during his time. You know, Luke wrote a lot of the New Testament, the book of Acts. He wrote the Gospel of Luke. Uh, Demas was kind of this community group leader, if you would. He talked about this group that was done uh, in, in their house. And so there were people that were brought around for a very good purpose. And our walk, it should never be alone. We should always have the right people to look for those people that God's called to be in our lives and encourage them to be with us. And I'm hoping for many of you that means you're a part of some form of a community group. Because if you're not now, and maybe it's virtual or maybe it's in person, but we all need to be involved and engage with other believers. So yes, you want people that are going to be encouraging and loyal and all that, but it's also very, if they're not believers, it's very important that we have people who can speak words of wisdom, people who are going to encourage us through the word, and when we have questions, uh, a lot of times we have many groups out there. I would encourage you guys to join one. Um, but we want to be a part of some form of a group that God can encourage us uh, through there. And so, as he speaks about these people, he says, hey, don't walk alone. He ends his letter saying, now when this epistle is read among you, see that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans. And then you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. And say that Ar Archippus... Take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. This salutation by my own hand, Paul, remember my chains. Grace be with you. Amen. The final point that Paul is asking to us, and he's writing this letter in chains, in prison, in Rome. He's saying, walk in freedom. Walk in the freedom that God has given us through his son Jesus. He says, remember my chains. The second place he spoke of chains in this last chapter of this book, of this letter. He says, even from prison, I want you to live freely. And for us here today, we're not in physical chains. We're not behind bars, but some of us have these chains around us that are holding us back from something. 
Perhaps as a ministry that he's been called to, as he gives this encouragement, he says, hey, walk worthy of the calling which you were called, as he reminds us in Ephesians 4 as well. He's speaking to our Christ, he's saying, hey, I know God's calling you for something, and, and perhaps that's a chance for someone in this room or someone online saying, hey, I know God's calling me to do something, I just don't know what it is, but how can God use me? The encouragement should be, God wants to use you. He has joy in using you. He wants you to walk with him, yes, but he also has a purpose for all of us to do something. Something as a witness, something to share the gospel. Maybe it's something serving the ministry, maybe it's something serving in this church, maybe it's something going out to a mission field to a totally different country. Whatever that may be. Maybe it's inviting a foster child to your home. Maybe it's caring for somebody. Maybe it's even being part of some of the events we talk about, a food share or Operation Christmas Child, whatever that may look like. God wants to use us. But we have to be willing to break these chains that He's put around us. And the reality of the matter is that. When he says, remember my change, remember the hardship that I've been through to get to this point. He says, hey, for all of us, we're going to have some change that are going to hold us back as well. But that freedom, well, it can only come from Jesus. Jesus came to break the chains of bondage. And for some of us, these chains have been broken, yet we're trying to crawl back into the cell that we've been freed from. And so what chains are holding you back? You see, there was a time when well, I'll close here when Paul spoke of this in the book of Acts. There was this big kind of riot and war and uh, mob that was going on, and Paul and his friends, Silas and others, they were put into prison. They were put in chains, and as they were in chains, there was this, uh, this, this Philippian jailer. And, and, and he was holding them at the guard and making sure that nothing happened. And there was an earthquake that happened, and you can read about this in Acts 16. And the earthquake happened, and the chains were broken, and the prisoners were free. And all of a sudden, this Philippian jailer was like, all right, that's it. They're going to kill me now because I can't allow those prisoners to escape, so I'm just going to go ahead and kill myself. But Paul, he encouraged him. He says, do yourself no harm, for we're all here. Yes, the chains are broken, but we're all here. Why? For a greater purpose. Because now this jailer, seeing that there is something real that's happening here, he says, uh, Paul called a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm. In verse 29 of Acts 16, it says, he called for a light, ran, and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. He brought them out and said, what must I do to be saved? He saw these chains were broken. He saw that what they were speaking of is actually real. So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. You and your household. And if you know the story, this Philippian jailer who was about to commit suicide actually was saved, him and his entire household, because of these chains that were broken, because of the work that Jesus did through Paul, and the witness life that that he had was so strong that he asked this question, what must I do to be saved? You see, we can't walk with God if we don't know Jesus. And so if you're watching online, if you're here today, maybe you don't feel the same closest relationship with Jesus. Maybe you have uh, some form of chains that are holding you back from this walk. Well, today is a day. It's an important one. It's a day after this election and all these other things that are happening in our world. But it's an important one as we as we stop and we be in this, this, this prayer mentality of saying, hey, God, what are you calling me to do? Hey, the chain, the discouragement that's been holding me back, maybe that's my chain. Maybe it's discouraged. Maybe my past is my chain. Every time I try to take a step forward, I'm reminded of the thing that I've done in my past, and maybe that is my chain. Maybe it's an addiction that we have. Whatever your chains may be, this is a time when Paul reminds us, hey, remember my chains? It's a time when Jesus is saying, hey, remember them, yes, but don't be bound by them. Why? Because Jesus came to break those chains. He wants to walk with us now. And now is the time to take that first step. For those of us who are walking with Jesus, we know that life without Jesus, well, it has a hopeless end. But life with Jesus, as we walk with God, it has an endless hope. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today, Lord. We're thankful of the reminder that you give us through Paul of just this way that you want to walk with us, Lord, that you're always there with us. We want to pray for anybody here that doesn't know you, that today will be a day that they will just free themselves, not in their own strength, but by saying, responding in the same way when this Philippian jailer asked, what must I do to be saved? It was as simple as, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Because if there's anybody watching, anybody here today that doesn't know you, that today will be a day of salvation. That they can come to know you and start this walk. Lord, we pray for anyone here today that is bound by chains of 
Maybe it's addiction. Maybe it's discouragement. Maybe it's something that's holding them back. Maybe it's just unbelief. Whatever that may be, that today will be a day where change will be remembered. Yes, as Paul remembered his. But that as we start this walk with you, as we continue this walk with you, as we walk even stronger, as we walk out of this place, a reminder, you want to walk with us through these open doors and with us in a constant communication through prayer. Knowing that you are by people so that we're never walking alone. You encourage us, Lord, and you give us freedom. Lord, we're so thankful for you, Lord. We're thankful for the work that you're doing in us. And so we pray as we walk for many with an uncertainty of what the world will be like tomorrow. That today be the moment that we're free from chains. Help us not to go back into bondage and just walk in freedom. And before we close our time, I'm just going to be in a time of prayer because it's just so needed. So I don't know if the rest of the world is doing this, but I know that in this place, we want to be in prayer for what's going to happen next. And so just for a moment, if you would be in a, a, a season of prayer, if you want to bow your heads and be in a season of prayer, we're going to play a song. And as we play in the song, we're going to be reminded of the power that's in Jesus, the same Jesus that wants to walk with us. But also be reminded of the change that may be holding us back. And as we feel him breaking the chains, that we think about it's, it's discouragement I feel, it's, it's, it's the unbelief that I feel, but I feel you taking those away because I want to walk out of here and do something different in my life. To be a better witness, to have a better walk. When you are ready, be in prayer. I want you just to stand. Stand as the song plays and you feel these chains be broken and you know he's calling you for something. We have for you to stand at the end of the song, hoping that we're all standing. We're going to close in prayer and we'll dismiss. So, be in a dire bed, be in a season of prayer, just stand when you feel ready.
Lord, remind the chains that were broken, Lord, that you came to break the chains that held us bound by this enemy that does exist. And as we see evil in this world, Lord, we want to be light. We want to be salt. We want to be able to shine a light for you so that people will come to know who you are. If there's anyone here today or watching online that doesn't know you, that today will be a day of salvation, Lord. We're thankful for the opportunity that you give us, Lord. Help us to be open to what you have in front of us. We pray for our nation. We pray for our local governments. We pray for all of our, our people that may go out and, and, and maybe make some wrong decisions, that they'll stop and, and just think and pray and know that there's a, a greater hope than what we see on TV, than what we see in, in government or anywhere else. But we know that you are sovereign, that you are in control of all things. And so help us to be reminded that we are free to walk with you. We're thankful for the freedom you give us in this country. We're thankful that we have a opportunity to be here in this place and be able to, 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 to share your word, read your word, and know you even deeper. And even these next few weeks as we go through a new series on undivided, we just continue to be united as a country and as a church. Lord, help us to be believers. That when people see us, that they see you, Lord. That you are that real. Bless us this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Guys, I want you to be out there this day as you start your walk. Be encouraged to know that God wants to walk with you. Shine His light. Be that salt. And bring love to this world that's full of hate and division. Be something that's different in this world. Be that believer. Be that Christian who's called us to be. Before you leave, we're just going to close this song. Your questions will uh, direct God. We look forward to seeing you next week. May God bless you guys. And we walk with God. God bless you.